Welcome again uh, to uh, all of our listeners here in another in our series of interviews with the experts. I'm Malcolm Bell. I'm your studio host uh, today. And our topic today is chronic total occlusions in 2025. I'm delighted to have as my guest today my uh, colleague, Dr. Greg Barsness. Uh, he's an assistant professor of uh, medicine. Uh, he works in our uh, uh, division of uh, critical care cardiology, but is also an interventional cardiologist, uh, very experienced and uh, particularly in the area of chronic total occlusion. So welcome, Greg. Thank you, Dr. Bell. It's really a pleasure to be here. So Greg, let's just uh, start off. Uh, you know, we know chronic total occlusions as CTOs. And so what exactly is a, a CTO and uh, where, where do we find these? Thank you. It's really important that we uh, kind of set set the uh, stage for what we're talking about. CTOs are a chronic occlusion of the uh, epicardial coronary artery, um, and you you determine chronic occlusion by a typical appearance of no flow, uh, an obstruction in the in the vessel, uh, with collaterals and no obvious clot that would suggest it was acute. Um, we sometimes kind of combine this uh, with with possible chronic occlusions, but classically and importantly uh, for trials and such, the chronic total occlusion is a occlusion existing for uh, greater than three months. So that's the definition, typical appearance of an occlusion for greater than three months. And, and how can you determine that it's more than three months? Yeah, that's great. So sometimes it's by history and you uh, know that people have been having symptoms uh, for a period of time, they may have had an event, um, that was uh, uh, recognized in uh, in hindsight. Um, often it's based on uh, coronary angiography or invasive or non-invasive assessment of the coronaries uh, with the presence of that lesion uh, that's then treated medically perhaps and followed for a time. Uh, and then uh, uh, it's determined to be chronic at that point. And so when we're doing an angiogram, someone with you know, ischemic heart disease, you know, whether it's a cardiomyopathy or history of angina, you know, recent infarct, how often uh, would we expect to see a, a chronic total occlusion at the time of that angiogram? Yeah, uh, chronic occlusions are recognized in a large minority of, of patients who undergo invasive assessment or non-invasive assessment of their coronaries. Pro about 25% historically of angiograms include a CTO uh, so, or an occlusion. Uh, and yet this group who are the same type of patients who would have uh, a risk for coronary atherosclerotic disease, these same patients uh, are only intervened upon about 4% of the time. It only represents 4% of interventions performed in the U.S., uh, even, even currently. And so uh, CTOs are frequent and yet are a marker for a less invasive management strategy. So as we're thinking then about... Uh the management strategy, you know, you, if, if we identify a CTO, and the CTO could be there presumably by itself, or it could be accompanied by other you know, uh, epicardial coronary disease, what are the treatment uh, options here? Uh, and then how, how do you weigh that up? I mean, it could be medical, presumably, it can be with PCI, we'll come back to that, uh, or even bypass surgery. That's right. So uh, medical therapy, of course, is foundational. Risk management, uh, medical therapy is foundational for anyone with established treatment with a risk of uh, atherosclerotic coronary disease. Unfortunately, in this group, as I just mentioned, in this group of patients with CTO, medical therapy is often where it stops. So we are often uh, treating these patients with prolonged medical therapy despite uh, uh, symptoms or obvious ischemic uh, burden. Um, CTOs are associated with ischemia, even in the asymptomatic population. So if you have a CTO, there is often, if not uh, usually, demonstrable ischemia associated with that, even the asymptomatic population. And so it's important to recognize that and important uh, in our treatment strategies to recognize that that's a possibility. So there's medical therapy, there's revascularization, and in patients with multivessel disease with a CTO, coronary artery bypass grafting, especially in the setting of diabetes or other risk factors or other comorbidities that would require invasive surgical management, coronary artery bypass grafting is certainly reasonable. In patients with uh, multivessel disease and a CTO, uh, often we will treat the non-CTO lesions 
um, with PCI perhaps in those either non-operative or those patients who through shared decision making we decide to treat with PCI. Um, those patients may have their non-CTO lesions treated uh, along with medical therapy to assess their symptom status. But in those patients, especially those patients with a lone residual CTO who are amenable for uh, revascularization, uh, particularly per percutaneous revascularization, and who remain symptomatic or have a large area of ischemia, those patients are very uh, good candidates for CTO-PCI. Just then to follow up that, you as the angiographer, what are the features that you're looking for in these CTOs that would make them uh, be, you know, feasible for intervention? And and obviously, I'm, I'm talking to someone who's an expert in this area. I mean, this is one of the areas that you truly uh, specialize and excel in. So what are we looking for there? And and then maybe at the same time, you know, you've already talked about the number, uh, or the proportion of angiograms that you know, we see a CTO, and, and yet the number that are actually presented for PCI is very, very small. And, and so are there, are, are we maybe, uh, not complacent, but maybe are we always thinking about whether or not the CTO is going to be treatable and do we get enough information on that angiogram that's going to help you in making the decision whether it's just feasible? That gets back to my first question. What are the features that you're looking for? Sure. How can we help guy present that uh, uh, those images you know, to you as the operator? Excellent topic. So you're absolutely right. It's an underserved population. Uh, just to go back a little bit, you know, there are a million patients or so just in the United States with refractory symptoms. And most of those patients will have some, you know, uh, combination of uh, CTO and other lesions that are untreated uh, and could benefit symptomatically uh, from CTO intervention. And so identifying those patients who are at risk and who have CTO and who are symptomatic. So in answer, direct answer to your question, the patients we're looking for are symptomatic. Beyond that, um, whether or not you can do a CTO is getting to be a less of an important point because we can treat almost any lesion in almost anyone. I mean, that's just the fact anymore. Our tools are so good, our strategies are so good, um, our, our knowledge base is so good, and our support in, in research uh, rich environments like ours. Our, our support is so good that we can treat m most of these patients. But in order to optimally treat these patients, the cognitive component, assessing the patients, assessing the lesion, just looking at the lesion carefully uh, for a long time before, under, uh, before taking on the procedure is the most important part of the procedure. And so if you're an angiographer and you're doing an inter, uh, angiogram uh, in a patient with CTO, you really want to have uh, optimized views, limit panning, really see if there's collateralization to that area, how robust a vessel it is. Uh, when we're assessing preoperatively CTOs, we want to see the proximal cap. We want to see the distal cap. We want to assess the lesion. We want to assess the length. We want to assess the calcium, the tortuosity. All of these things have a bearing on our approach to the lesion and our likelihood of success which then translates into our ability to talk to the patient and give them really concrete ideas about risk versus benefit in their particular situation. It's essential. So good angiography is critical. And just listening to you describe those, uh, those steps that you uh, just outlined, and particularly in terms of analyzing the angiogram very uh, carefully, I imagine that uh, these are cases that we should not be doing ad hoc, requires uh, you know, a lot of thought uh, and, and planning. And is, is that something that you would agree with? I, I do agree. It's a very rare instance where you would uh, tackle a CTO in a non-planned uh, you know, procedure. Uh, there are occasions uh, where um, even in ACS where you might go ahead and, uh, and treat a a CTO uh, in some very specific instances uh, in, a, in an ad hoc fashion. But really, um, because these are stable coronary syndromes by and large, uh, we have the luxury of time uh, and we want to give it the best 
uh, we want to give the patients the best opportunity for benefit uh, because we're talking about symptomatic improvement. We're not talking about survival or major adverse cardiac event reduction. We, we don't see that. This is a stable coronary syndrome. And just like all stable coronary syndromes, we can't expect a major adverse cardiac event reduction. We want to improve symptoms and provide a durable symptom response. We want to get the best uh, um, uh, result possible, and that involves planning. Yeah, I think you make some really good points there. I mean, we're doing this for symptomatic improvement um, in, in general. I mean, there is still some question about whether there might be some benefit beyond that, but very often we'll just even tell patients, look, it's occluded. It can't get any worse. It's not going to go and cause a heart attack, but uh, it may not be as, uh, as as simple as that. Just getting back to the ad hoc uh, procedure, I mean, we've all been there. It looks like a relatively short CTO is is there harm in trying to open that up or because of course in your business your case is obviously a little bit longer but it's all about escalation you know mm -hmm. you have to be prepared to escalate there and so what what's your advice for the person who's tempted to try to treat that uh, anti-grade uh, cto as an ad hoc uh, procedure and whether that uh, then it um, impacts subsequent success if it has to come back and be treated uh, again. Yeah, good. There are there are implications for, uh, we'll say, false starts. Uh, you, uh, I would say even though it looks simple or short or, you know, you want to give it a go, you can always make things worse. So, okay. um, you know, there, there's no, nothing you can't make worse. And so um, uh, I think um, I don't want to dissuade people from, you know, given doing their best uh, job at, 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 uh, and I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, there's, there's no magic to this. Part of it's learning and, and exploration about, um, among your, you know, with your skill set. But you can make things worse if there's a big dissection. It does delay care for that patient. Uh, we usually let uh, uh, lesions heal if there is a prior attempt. We let lesions heal for four to six weeks prior to reattempting, um, and you can cause uh, perforation. It's relatively rare, but not impossible. The type of techniques you generally use to kind of probe that lesion with a wire forward technique, um, that is how you cause perforations. That's how you cause dissections, uh, and that can lead to uh, trauma that's sufficient to put the patient's life at risk. And so even simple attempts uh, um, are not often, are not always simple. And so I think um, my advice is to think carefully about the benefits versus the risk. Again, this is symptom reduction in these patients. If you're gonna put a patient at risk for doing that, you wanna be able to have talked to them. So consent is an important part of this. Risk uh, in, in overall, risk in treating these lesions is still three to five, even up to 10%. Um, uh, and those are serious risks of death, infarction, uh, major bleeding. Uh, and so, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to take that on unless you're really certain that the patient is up for it and you're up for it. You know, and then just to say, uh, you know, comment, you know, and I've, I've heard this discussed and you looked at some cases where the patient with multivessel disease and they said, well, you've got the CTO, we'll just fix everything else and then we'll see how you go. But, um, but I think that you, you, I'm sure you've seen some of these cases where then someone has stented, you know, across what the branch was that was really providing the collaterals and, and then maybe impact the ability to do a, a, a retrograde approach through those uh, collaterals. What a, what a great point. And, and also with a fresh stent, we can't just go uh, and use those collaterals. We can always uh, longitudinally shorten these stents. We can do all sorts of um, bad things to uh, previously uh, established really good PCI results. And so, um, yes, that's exactly right. So e even even doing the non-CTO lesions, if there's a plan to go ahead, uh, let's say the LID is occluded and you say, well, the right's there and obvious, I'll just treat that. That can really delay and or cause adverse outcome if you're trying to do this. So what seems like a relatively straightforward strategy actually might not be so straightforward and, com and uh, create some... Uh, uh, challenges for you later. So you've talked about uh, complication rates, so uh, we, we don't need to go uh, discuss that anymore. Uh, it's obviously you know significantly higher than the typical 
complication rate in terms of serious complications that we, we quote for someone undergoing PCI. Success rates, you're not so long ago, we're not much higher than your 70% or so. And uh, but with the advent of your new equipment and the expertise, you're putting uh, um, your limited hands. What is the current success rate uh, on average that we would be quoting our patients? Right. We are so fortunate to have the new tools and the new techniques and just the knowledge base from, uh, uh, you know, 30, 40 years now trying these CTOs. And so uh, you're right. In the past, 50% was kind of the marker of success rates. And that was all comers, including, uh, you know, short, long, whatever uh, CTOs. Um, the uh, the current success rate that I think you can expect in an experience center, this is the is it the right patient at the right center with institutional experience and a good knowledge base with a team that knows what they're doing and what to expect? Uh, the the uh, outcome can be the successful, uh, technically successful procedure uh, is possible in 80 to 90 percent of patients uh, readily and uh, um, in really experienced hands, uh, you know, and and in trials particularly where the where the lesions might not be quite as uh, signet, quite as difficult, uh, they report up to 95% success. So uh, it's getting pretty good. That's really impressive. I mean, that's, that's pretty come along in leaps and bounds. So just as we wrap this up, uh, Greg, uh, what's on the horizon you know, for uh, treatment of uh, CTOs you know, over and above what we have you know, at present? Yeah. So I think the most important thing happening in the CTO, CTO world, apart from the constant evolution of techniques and, and uh, devices. The devices that we have uh, have exploded in number and uh, Im improvements. Um, but uh, as that continues, we still need to step back and really assess the right patient population, the, the benefit that we can expect. So that I think continued research is critical in this area. The number of CTO attempts are going up, the success rate is going up, um, but the patient outcomes remain a little bit unclear. It's unclear exactly what we're doing. I think symptom improvement is well established and agreed upon, but all the other outcomes are unclear. And so there are clinical trials looking at uh, uh, sham controlled CTO, the orbit of CTO trial is ongoing. There are other uh, really uh, fundamental trials going on for procedural techniques, procedural um, uh, preparation and outcomes. Uh, that uh, we really need to see those to really tailor our therapies to the right patient in the right setting for best outcome. And maybe just very briefly, um, any advances in terms of imaging, you know, either you know, for planning and during the procedure? Yeah, so I imaging is critical. I think preoperative uh, imaging with uh, good angiographies, we talked about dual access kind of uh, imaging uh, to see to see all collaterals and everything during the procedure, those are essential. But uh, intravascular imaging plays a great role in CTOs to establish um, uh, luminal, uh, how lum when you're luminal, extra luminal, what the calcium burden is, uh, sizing uh, really improves outcome. Uh, also, uh, a lesion uh, assessment preoperatively with CTA. Uh, can uh, can be very helpful, and there are evolving strategies to uh, uh, that we can incorporate to really facilitate our our care. Um, but those are uh, imaging, especially intracoronary imaging. While it plays a, a big role in usual, you know, normal day to day PCI, really plays a huge role in CTO intervention. Okay. Well, Greg, that's all we have uh, time for today. So. Uh... I think you've made some really important uh, points, particularly about the added thoughtfulness in terms of selecting the patients, how you do the angiogram, how you think about you know, the different treatment options. Um, and so again, just want to thank you uh, for, for sharing uh, your expertise, your experience, and, and the advice that you've given. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Bell. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's all we have time for today. And I look forward to seeing you on another of our uh, podcasts on interviews with the experts.